Okay, this is section C on waves, the first lessons on the properties of waves, the basic properties of waves, okay? Now it's pivotal that we understand these. Um, we'll look at the two different types of wave, we'll look at what wavelength and amplitude are, frequency and time period, then the wave equation, and then basics about reflection, refraction and diffraction, but we won't be going into this part in much detail because we go into that part uh, in detail later. Okay, so the first thing then uh, is just to remind you of the different types of waves. So we've got transverse and longitudinal. Okay, in transverse waves, in a transverse wave, the wave propagates in one direction, but the particles themselves, which make up the wave, the particles themselves vibrate at 90 degrees to the direction of travel of the wave, trans, across. So they move at 90 degrees to the direction of travel. Now, most waves that you come across will be transverse waves. So for example, waves on a rope or water waves. Now, all electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, all of them. Um, now, longitudinal waves, they travel in a different way. So a longitudinal wave, which you will have seen in the classroom using a slinky, the most famous example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. And that's where particles vibrate in the same direction, parallel to, rather than perpendicular, like in a transverse wave, in a longitudinal wave, the particles vibrate parallel to the direction of travel. So what happens, if you look at it on a slinky, you'll have your slinky, and suddenly you'll get your compression which moves along so you'll have a large gap then waves very close together then a large gap and then it will continue so here we've got a pulse moving along our slinky where the particles are pushing together so this area here is called a compression and either side of that you get rarefaction that's where the particles spread out so a longitudinal wave the most famous example is a sound wave and transverse waves, almost all the waves you come across, including all the electromagnetic waves. Now, another thing you must understand is wavelength and amplitude. Now, if you look at something like this, now this here is a diagram of a wave. Now, because this axis here says distance, um, we know then that this is a length, a length of the wave. Now here we could also have displacement. Now if we look at this, the amplitude of the wave is the distance from there to there. So this here is the amplitude. So the amplitude is the distance from the centre, equilibrium, to the crest or from the trough to the equilibrium. This is also the amplitude. So the amplitude is the distance between there and there, or there and there. It is not from the bottom to the top, which is frequently answered incorrectly. It's from the centre to the bottom, or the centre to the top, not top to bottom. Now, that's the amplitude, and you'll often be asked to label that on a diagram. Now, because this axis says distance, we know this is a length. So we can label the wavelength. So the wavelength is the distance between two identical parts of a wave. So for example, if this was 10 centimetres and this was 20 centimetres, oh we're in metres, apologies. If this here is 10 metres and this is 20 metres, and the wavelength of our wave is from there to there, which is 20 metres. So the wavelength is from there to there. And we often use the symbol lambda to represent wavelength. Now the wavelength, because it's the distance between two identical parts on a wave, we could see then that it could also be The wavelength could also be the distance from there 
to there because they are two identical points on a wave. So the wavelength is just simply the distance between two identical parts on the wave. So in this case, from there to there would be 20 meters. All right? Now, in addition to that, it's important to understand what frequency and time period are. So if we look here, here we've got the axes for a graph, but rather than it being distance, this time it says time. So if you think about this and say, Um, apologies. Okay, so we could have naught point naught one, naught point naught two, naught point naught three, naught point naught four, and naught point naught five. So here we could have a wave, but this time, rather than being a distance, it's a time. So if our wave looked like this, okay, so here we've got our wave, and we could be asked what the time period is for the wave. So the time period, T, is the time for one complete wave. So in this case, if we think about the wave starting here, up to the crest, down to the trough, and back again, this is 0.02 seconds. So the time period of this wave is 0.02 seconds. Now, the frequency of a wave is the number of complete cycles or waves per second. So the frequency is the number of waves per second and it's measured in hertz. HZ is the symbol. So in order to calculate the frequency of this wave, we'd have to look at how many of these fit into one second. So the easiest way to do that is to say, well, the frequency must be, the frequency must be, oops, a daisy, one second divided by the time period so it would be 1 divided by 0 0.02, and that would equal 50 hertz. So the time period here would be 50 hertz, because there would be 50 of these in one second. Now then. Once we work out what time period are and frequency are, we can use this, along with wavelength, to use what's called the wave equation. Now the wave equation is, what is the speed of a wave? And the speed of a wave, the wave speed, equals frequency times wavelength. And how we write this, normally we say V equals F lambda. The velocity of the wave is the frequency times wavelength. Now, this is quite straightforward because if we think about it, each wave has a length, and if you produce so many of them per second, then how far will the, fir will the first wave have travelled after one second? So if you produce 10 waves in a second, then each wave is 2 metres long, then they must have travelled 10 times 2 which would be 20 meters in that second. So, velocity is measured in meters per second, frequency is measured in hertz, and wavelength is measured in meters. All right, now this will be, it's a relatively straightforward concept, so they'll try and use, uh, encourage you to rearrange the equation, or maybe they'll put the units in centimeters to try and make it slightly more difficult, or they might use kilohertz or something like this. So for example, if we think about, uh, we'll try and make it more difficult. So they could say to us, if we use the equation V equals F lambda. So we could be asked something like this. If the velocity of a wave 
is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's the speed of light. If something's traveling at the speed of light and its wavelength or its frequency, say its frequency is, say it's 1.5 kilohertz. And they could say to us, what must be the wavelength? So here we've got a problem because we've got this kilohertz, so we need to understand kilo means thousand. So this is actually one and a half thousand hertz. So this equals 1,500 hertz. And now all we need to do is rearrange our equation. So we could say lambda equals V divided by F, which equals 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by our frequency, which was 1,500. And then, I run out of space, and then Oops. Then we can work out our answer, which would be um, 2 times 10 to the 5 meters uh, per second. Oops, apologies, we're in meters. Now then, so that is important. The reason I mentioned this one is because it's in kilohertz as opposed to hertz, but. Um, 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1 plus 5 times 10 to the 3. 2 times 10 to the 5, yeah. So, now, the last thing I want to mention is reflection, refraction, and diffraction. Now, we won't go into any detail on this at the moment, but just to remind you, um, very important, the law of reflection states that if we have a mirror, then a line at right angles to the mirror is called the normal. And that if we have an incident ray of light then it will reflect and the law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And that's simply it. That is the law of reflection. Okay? We also need to remember that light also refracts. And we'll talk about this in a lot more detail later. But here we have our normal. And if our incident ray comes in, if this here was say glass and this was air, then this is more optically dense. So this means that as the light enters it, because it's entering at an angle, when it slows down it will cause it to change direction and bend towards the normal. So now it will go towards the normal. And remember this angle here at the top, this is the angle of instance, and this is the angle of refraction. All right, but we'll be going in the, over this in a lot more detail later, because this is Snell's law. And the last thing we mentioned there also was diffraction. And if you remember, diffraction was simply when a wave passes through a gap, which is similar, the gap is similar in size to the wavelength of the wave and this causes the wave to spread out like this and this is called diffraction. So when a wave passes through a gap which is similar in size to the wavelength of that wave, the wave will spread out in a different pattern and this is called diffraction. Um, and that's all we need to say about that for the moment.